such a pleasure to have you, Joe. I, um, I'm excited to hear you share. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, um, it was really nice to listen to that. And, and I agree, you know, with what he's talking about is the love and that's the way that we need to connect. But what I'm seeing is when I'm working with people is um, people are really finding right now that their biggest cruxes are coming into place. Um, you know, and it's like you said, we have to be able to fall onto our face completely before we get up and change. And right. what I've been finding is people when they're uh, really, I'm from Minnesota, um, where uh, that vandalism was started by that man dressed in black with the umbrella. Um, that was an auto store that I went to at one time. Uh, the Napa that was burned, that was, that I had gone there. Uh, the Target, the Cub, I had gone there. I shopped there. Um, the pharmacy uh, that was set on fire was at the end of my daughter's block uh, where she still lives. And so mm -hmm. it really hit me. And when I've been talking to people from home and I've been talking to people and clients, people are really coming up and they got so much anger and they're so pissed off. And, and so it's very interesting because there's people that are pissed off because a black person got killed and then they're pissed off because of what the police did. And then they're pissed off about the protesters doing. And so I said, okay, I said, well, what is it that's inside you that's really got you upset? Because um, the thing that we want to be able to find is if, if I'm ferociously pissed and I'm ferociously angry about something, there's something besides something that I saw on the TV. Um, even though it's completely, totally 1000% atrocious, you know, the way that black men are followed because they're black, they're killed because they're black, you know, I mean, uh, that kind of stuff is, is completely atrocious. But when we get completely really tangled up in our own anger, we want to look to see what is it that is in me that I'm having problems with. And one of the things that I had thought, and the reason I'm talking about this is I want to be able to help people change. We need to know what's stuck in order to be able to change. And so if I have this really bad anger about it, I have to look back and say, okay, why am I pissed about this? So I'm sitting there and I'm seeing these people protest and I think that they should protest, but I'm mad and I'm angry. Then what I look and it's like, oh, if I would have stood up to a parent or a teacher when I was little and said that that's not okay, that's not right, I would have gotten so much trouble. And so when people watch people protest, whether they're taking a knee at a football game or something like that, there's a reason. It's like, you can't do that. You can't fight authority. You know, there's this fear that they have that's stopping them from allowing any kind of protest. Because I ask people, it's like, oh, okay, cool. You know, taking a knee at a football game is a horrible, despicable thing, you know, and it's like, oh, really? OK, cool. OK, um, you know, walking down the street in front of the police precinct, you know, uh, in the middle of the day is a horrible, despicable thing. It's like, oh, OK, um, blocking the freeways. You know, um, you know, not riding the buses back when Rosa Parks did it, when they just basically said, we're not going to ride the buses. That was a horrible, despicable thing. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, let's look at this. It's horribly despicable to stand up and say, ouch. You know, and it's like, OK, how come it's horribly despicable to do that? Because I have a friend and the guy is one of the nicest guys. If you see, I mean, you will always see him at philanthropic events, you know, and he likes to go there because he likes parties, but he likes to be able to give checks. The guy grew up poor and now he's got three businesses. He's really incredibly successful and he's been stopped more times because of being black. He says he no longer will ever buy a Cadillac. Because being a black man in America in a Cadillac, he says, is the dumbest thing you could be. He says, when I started to drive a Mercedes, he says, I, he says the amount of times I got stopped just plummeted. And it's like, ow. Oh. And the guy says, it really stinks because I much prefer a Cadillac because it's more comfortable. I'm bigger and I like a Cadillac. Mercedes are smaller and they're cramped. But so I ask people, it's like, when we're so bothered, when we're so upset, what is it inside of us that's really the part that's hurt? What is the the part that's scared? And so at what point is going to be something that you're willing to be able to say, yes, this person that's really mad, that's really upset, they get to protest. OK, and what's the part, you know, and when we see this, when we, you know, with the COVID, OK, what part in us is going to finally be able to say, OK, hold on a second. The president's sitting there. And he's listening to the two doctors 
talk about this. And they say, we're going to liberally report the COVID deaths. And so if they have COVID and they die from cancer, we're going to say it's a COVID death. And so we hear in front of us that the authorities tell us that they're liberally going to report. It's like, I don't know about you guys, but the last time that liberal or actually the first time that liberal to me was like, holy crap, I'll never do that again, is when I was writing a paper in college and the professor said, you know, you're awfully liberal with your facts. And he gave me a D minus, you know, because I was liberal instead of spot on. And so I got a D on my paper. But the government is in front and they're saying, we're liberally going to do this. We're going to lie to you. Okay. And people basically say, oh, okay, 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 okay. You know, and then all of a sudden they come back a couple weeks later and they said, oh, you know what? We over exaggerated. You know, we told you the wrong thing. And so now we're going to correct it. You know, and so it's like, and people are still sitting there. And and I tell people, it's like, there's nothing going to change in America until the cable goes out. Because as long as people can sit there and, you know, they, you know, you know, as long as they can be on their phone, as long as they can be on Netflix, as long as they can be on YouTube, as long as they can be on Snapchat, you know, uh, iFunny, things like that, it's going to be too easy to just sit there, you know, and never change. And so I ask people, it's like when you're really looking at this, when you're ferociously angry at somebody for doing something. I want to see is like, is it really what they're doing? And, you know, certainly when they're when they're burning, you know, the stores that my daughter shops at. Now my daughter is going to have to go, you know, another 20 minutes to go to a grocery store, you know. Um, uh, And so when they burn the grocery store, when they burn Lloyd's Pharmacy that's been there for like 85, 90 years. And that family was just an incredible family. When they burned that, certainly I'm really, really pissed and I'm really upset. But there's a part of me that knows it's like, okay, there's a hurt that's going on. And I can't just get to the point where it's like completely black or completely white. And, you know, and that analogy really holds because there's nothing right now that's completely black and completely white. And so when I talk with people right now, there's so many people that are so overly upset and rot and everything and you know they question their own sanity i was like okay well let's think about this a second okay we just went through you know four months of completely shutting down you have to wear a mask in order to go some places you can't go to a restaurant you can't go to a movie theater you can't go to the beach <laughs> that's my pet peeve you can't go to the beach and it's like if you do go to the beach you can't sit down <laughs> you know um So there's all of these things that they've completely taken our lives and our lives aren't ours anymore, you know? Um, And then when you, when people started coming out and they started walking and biking and things like that, because I do that. I walk in the morning, I walk at night. And, um, and all of a sudden there was families out biking and walking. And I was like, wow, this is fantastic. This is like back in the fifties and the sixties when families hung out together, you know? And then all of a sudden they come in and they shut you down a little bit more. Stay close to home. You know, and people say, okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so at what point are people going to look up and they're going to question it? It's like, huh, okay, you told us that you were going to liberally report, which got me a D minus in college. Um, And now you told us that you did get a D minus and you said that you're going to change it. But yet we're still having to shut the world down, you know. And so, and then when this whole COVID thing comes up, it's like, okay, there was three police officers that threw grocery carts through bus stop windows, you know? And, okay, just a second. There's three police officers that vandalized public property, city property, on purpose. And they haven't been reprimanded. You know, I don't know. I would think that would piss somebody off. How come the news stations aren't trying to follow that story? You know, the person that you can see through the gas mask, and he's got a you know a gas mask that's supposedly issued by the police department. His boots and his pants were the same thing. And supposedly he walked right to the precinct after he did it. 
there's no news station following that down and saying this is you know john smith and this is where he's from the fact that uh, in minnesota most of the protesters that were arrested either two or three nights ago now i've lost count they weren't from the state of minnesota and the majority of them that were arrested were white when they had the peaceful protest, they had two uh, rows of uh, mostly African Americans, and um, and they were sitting down Indian style with their arms crossed or with their arms interlinked. And behind them, there was two rows of other people, mostly black people, with their hands up in the air. Up in the air, it was people behind that that started to throw the bricks. Um, excuse me, but where did you find the bricks in the city? Okay. I've lived there, you know, I, I've lived in Minnesota in those areas for 47 years. Okay, trust me, there's no red bricks to be had. All the buildings around there were made with big blocks. Okay, so where did they find red bricks? Okay, nobody's asking that question. You know, um, all these full water bottles and everything like that, where'd they all come from? Um, and then, you know, why did the police, when they were spraying the mace and when they were sh uh, shooting the concussion grenades, why did they shoot them at the people that were sitting down? And why did they shoot them at the people that were standing up with their hands in the air? And why did they spray the mace and the pepper spray at the peaceful protesters? Those things have aim. They could have easily shot it to the people in the back. They could have easily walked up, not touched the people that were sitting down on the ground. And they could have done it to the people in the back or they could have walked around those peaceful protesters. So what I'm asking people to do is, what are you really pissed about? How come you're okay? And when I ask this, people expect me, you know, I'm a healer, I'm supposed to be Om and Namaste. And it's just like, okay, I've been doing this work for 19 years. And it's like, I'm not going to be that. When we have a session, you're going to laugh, it's going to be funny, and you're going to feel better. Uh, when I work with people, um, it's so incredible, because Tom and I, we really share a lot of similar beliefs, because my whole deal is I want people to be their magnificent self. And when he was talking about the divinity that we all have in us, n none of us were held and said, oh, shit, look at this one. It's like, are we sure we're going to keep this kid alive? I think we should throw this kid back. When we were held, whether it was by the nurses, the doctors, our family, because granted, we didn't all grow up in great places. Somebody held us and said, oh, my God, look at this miracle. Look at this amazing kid. So that's the part that I want us to all feel again, is I want us to be able to feel how magnificent we are. And when you're walking down the streets and you're seeing that other person, look at them like they are the most magnificent being you've ever seen, because they probably are. And that whole thing about when we see people and we don't know what they've been through, we don't. You would ask about the one day, uh, what does that mean? One day, for me, it means today's the only day I have. Okay. I've had three different instances um, uh, in which I almost died. Um, uh, you know, uh, 18 years ago, 19 years ago, the doctors actually sent me home to die because I had a very severe illness. Um, they had worked with me for six and a half years. I was on oxygen for almost two, and they knew that they only had one more treatment that they could give me. But if it didn't work, one of the doctors thought it would kill me. The other doctor said it would hasten my death. So they sent me home to die. And luckily, I met an incredible energy healer. I went to him and his students. After the second hour, I was perfectly healthy. Or after the second hour, I was off the oxygen. And after the third, I was perfectly healthy. And so, and one of the other things, and when people talk about these viruses, you don't know Jack. And it's just like, actually, I do. When I was a kid, I had the Hong Kong flu. And the Hong Kong flu was one of those viruses that was incredibly dangerous, incredibly toxic, and people died from it all the time. They wouldn't let me go to the hospital because they were afraid that I would infect the hospital. But the doctor had said, it's like, hey, and my mom says, should we lock him up in his room now that we know what's going on? And he says, well, he says, I've been here already two days treating your son twice a day. And he says, and your neighbors have been here and you're, they've been exposed to all of his you know, his brother and his sister. Um, if they were going to get it, they would have gotten it. And so I went through an incredibly horrible time. It was a very difficult illness. I had to take ice baths um, uh, three days in a row to be able to break the, the fevers. So that, but last August, um, I had a horrible issue that happened. I ended up in the hospital um, and had to have emergency surgery and ended up having that a second emergency surgery and then a surgery to correct that. 
Um, and when I was in the hospital, the first four days, I had this dream that came up to my, uh, came up every time I fell asleep. It was so bad that I didn't want to fall asleep. And the dream kept on asking me, it's like, do you accept yourself? It's like, um, yeah, you know, um, yeah, you know, it's like, really, do you accept yourself? And so it would show me something in my life in which I made a mistake. It showed me something with, you know, past relationships with my daughters. Every time I fell asleep, it would show me something different. And it would ask me, do you accept you? Do you accept yourself? And it finally came to the point where I'm in bed, can't do anything, um, you know, um, in massive pain, you know. So I'm sitting there, it's like, okay, so, hey, you're in bed, you're bumping a log, can't make any money, can't do anything. Do you still accept yourself? And I had to wrestle with that, you know, like two or three sleeps in order to be able to like, yes, I do. You know, just the fact that I'm here, I do accept myself. And so I'm asking people, it's like, there's so many things. And during this COVID time, when you haven't had to go to work, um, you haven't had to go to the meetings, you haven't had to travel out of town, you've had the opportunity. And like Tom had said, it's like, when he was down in South America, he said, do I want to be doing this? And so for ourselves, it's like, what is it that's important? And for me, what I look at is, is there's when you all of us have been talking about the fact that we have to be in order to be able to make differences. And so for me, one of the things that I've chosen to be is that I try that when I see somebody, whether I'm walking on the street, whether they're, they're the cashier or the stock person, um, no matter who they are, I try and make them feel and know in that brief interchange that they matter and that they're loved. Okay, They might not get it when I'm walking down the street and I just smile to them or I say something. But right now, what I'm asking people to do is really step into your power. Because that, you know, Tom was talking about the divinity within. You know, and so it's like the divinity that we have in, within inside of ourselves. We all are that gift. And I'm that gift that I can give to you. OK, and so I'm that, you know, God basically made me in God's image. And um, in every culture that I know, Native American, Aboriginal, Celtic, everybody at one time knew they were the chosen people. That didn't mean that I'm the only one. They just knew the creator made me. So the creator's got to feel that I'm special. So it's my belief that if I can go out and I can make you feel just a little bit happier, a little bit nicer, that you know that somebody took the time to smile at you, to nod, to wave, anything like that, it's going to be, you know, it's going to make the world a little bit better one person at a time. So uh, I haven't been watching the time clock. <laughs> so, and I, so. What, oh, you're you're great. I appreciate everything you just said. You you uh, you kind of connected a lot of dots uh, with what Tom was saying. Um, so in your so in your experience for, in your work, you know, with with you know help healing and uh, you know helping people seeing their own power. Like, where in your journey did you discover that? For yourself like where did you when did you realize the gift that you are um there was two times uh one i was actually on a retreat and um the counselor had uh took me um and she she said joe uh, what it was it was actually up at uh, hazelton minnesota at the treatment center and i was in the um uh, al -Anon portion of that and she says joe would you be willing to talk to these women about what it's like to grow up in a dysfunctional family and everything i thought it was like well, okay you know i'm thinking whatever whatever she had me talk to these 17 women and i told them about what it was like to grow up me and all 17 women were crying like crazy and it was the first time in my life that I realized I wasn't the problem. I wasn't the bad person. I wasn't the bad issue. That was one. And then the other is when I had that illness that I told you about where the doctor sent me home to die, um, I had to go and I had to tell people, you cannot do that near me. If you do that near me, I will get sick. And so um, I ended up being very responsible for myself because I was immune compromised for over three and a half years. And so when I started to stand up for myself and I took care of me, I, I realized that, hey, you know what? 
I have a spot on earth and just by being here, I'm worthy and I'm valuable. And when I got better, when I went to that third session and it was just a shock, I mean, because I had to wear a mask and I had to wear oxygen. And so when people say that the mask is necessary, it's like, okay, don't do that. I know about that and you're wrong. So don't do that. I had to wear oxygen in order to be able to keep more pure air in my uh, body. And, um, and when I didn't need that, and I could walk out, you know, and a bus came by with that pollution and it didn't make me sick. And I smelled somebody fertilizing the yard and it didn't make me lose my vision. You know, I was like, I mean, I was just like, oh, my God. Um, and so when I got that life back, I was just like, whoa. And I was told immediately, it's like, well, hey, you can come back and you can work for me again because I used to do construction um, and I could fix anything in your house. But I was like, oh, no, no. I can do this healing work. And if I don't do this healing work, I'd be kicking God in the teeth. You know, it's like, yeah, it'd be nice to go back to construction. That'd be easy. But to be able to help people to change their lives um, and to be able to bring that kind of hope, um, you know, this, you know, it's like, this is how I am. If, if we can't live like this every so often, if we can't go, yeah, if we can't do that every so often, why the hell are we here? I mean, seriously, that's a that's a challenge I ask you guys. It's like, you know, when you talk about one day for you guys, okay, have you been able to do that a couple of days through the week, <laughs> you know? Um, because if we can't live like that, you know, or if we can't, you know, hug somebody, you know, and say, man, you made my day so much nicer, you know, um, what are we doing? If we can't do that, why the hell are we here? We didn't come here to work for 3B, 3M or IBM or Microsoft or Netflix. We didn't come here to do that. We were born. And why were we born? We were born in a creator's image that created everything of awe, everything of awesomeness, everything. I mean, because whether you look at the sunrise, the sunset, the starfish, you know, the mackerel, you know, the dove. Every single thing here is just awesome and gorgeous. And you're one of those awesome and gorgeous things. And are you feeling that? You know, because, I mean, it's like people go to the zoo for a special time. It's like, Shh, come on, the zoo's outside. You know, it's like, have you, have you gotten, you know, excited about the fact that you see a robin or you hear a robin? You know, do you get excited about the fact that you can smell a plumeria, you know? Um, one day is right now. I've had too many times where one day was really a question. One day was not guaranteed. I mean, I sat there and I went to bed day after day for over a year and a half, not knowing if I would wake up. So for me, one day is now. And it's like one day, it's like, Everybody talks about, well, the race things are going to get better. When? We got to do something now. We got to make one day today count. Are you going to be able to tell your neighbor that they matter, that they're cool, that they're okay? You know, are you going to email? Are you going to call? What are you going to do to basically be able to tell your grandkids? You know, you're talking about your kids that aren't born yet. Are you going to be able to look at their kids someday and say, hey, you know what? When I was your dad's age, this is what I did to try and make people feel like they were safe. This is what I did so somebody wasn't freaked out because they were the wrong color in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, and this is, yeah, it's like, I love what you're pointing to there, because it's not just the actions of a few that have led to this, it's the inactions of the many. It's every time that we had an opportunity to speak up and we didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing, I'm bringing Tom back in, in this. Yeah. Hey, April, so like, let, let's give them the chance to connect and talk for a yeah. second. Mike has gotten really buzzy. Would you reset it really fast? Yes. Let's, Hey, Tom. Hey, can you uh, hear me okay? I can I, hear you fine. I, I had a mic problem 
earlier, but I, it was coming. Some, I was getting some sort of static, but now I'm, I've been moving around. <laughs> yeah. And Joe's been talking. But Joe, you've been moving me anyway, but I've been moving uh, physically. And um, good stuff. I mean, your, your journey has been remarkable. Uh, and, and the fact that you can pull from that and share and uplift others. I mean, we're all uplifters, but there's some of us that, 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 that is what we're meant to do mm-hmm. full time. <laughs> and, and, and so it's an incredible journey. And, you know, I, I think we're, you know, we're, we're eternal beings. So, so, you know, I think, you know, when, when we do leave this physical life, we just go into the next room, right? We're, there's a very thin veil between this. And I, I, think, um, I think you're right. We've come here for joy. And if it's anything else but joy, we're doing something wrong. And, and what's going on uh, today, um, it is, it, it's, these are not, you know, they're, these are not isolated instances, right? This is the, this is the world. We are creators, right? God created us, but we're created with those same creative powers. Uh, you know, if if we could get lined up enough, we could walk on water, <laughs> but we just don't believe we can. So we'll never walk on water. But we can do what you're doing, Joe. We can we can lift one person up one at a time, and that person can lift somebody up, and that person can lift somebody up. So, um, yeah. You know, it's a time, you know, peace, people want to, you know, do the OM and all that. And I understand that. I completely get it. I completely appreciate, uh, appreciate it and such like that. But it's also something, you know, Jesus flipped the tables. You know, Jesus says, hey, you know what? This is enough is enough. And so I don't I'm not condoning the riots when I say that, but I definitely am condoning the fact that, OK, hold on a second this, we need to be able to change. And so the joy, yes, but it's one of those things where, um, you know, they say no justice, no peace, you know, or where one is trampled upon, all are trampled upon. And I can't remember the exact quote, but it's like, we get to basically say, it's like, okay, yep, I'd like to have a cup of joy right now, but you know, my brother here needs some help, <laughs> you know? Uh, and but that, bring, but that, that, my argument would be that that will bring you joy. Right. I mean, that will, that will yeah. when you can help somebody out when you can lift them up. Boy, I don't think there's anything that makes you feel oh, yeah, better. Exactly. That's the thing that's yeah. been terrific because down here in uh, Boca Raton in Florida, they had protests and there was whites and there was blacks and they were laughing and they were high fiving, you know, and they were holding up their love signs, it. you know, and um, but it was something it's like, hey, cool, you know, and yeah. um, people, you know, and so, yeah, helping each other is the most important thing right now and not letting this go to sleep, you know, and mm-hmm. the COVID stuff and everything like that, the same thing, you know, not letting it go to sleep. There's no way in hell that I want a guy that makes shitty computers that have, you need to buy virus protection. I don't want him to tell me he's going to protect me from a biological virus when he doesn't know. And all of his practices have failed, you know, there's no way I want that. So we have to be able to stand up, you know, and, uh, and yes, when we can keep that joy and that respect for somebody else, and when we can see the divinity in somebody else and be able to say, this is what I feel. Hey, now it's your turn to speak. What do you think? You know, um, I think finding that respect with each other, like you were talking about, is great. We're all one, right? We all yeah. come from the same thing. Uh, we, yeah. I, I love it. I love it. I want to bring in a, a quote that feels relevant. Um, oh, great. Another than uh, Mr. Alfred Einstein said, if one day you have to choose between the world and love, remember this. If you choose the world, you'll be left without love. But if you choose love, with it, you will conquer the world. Cool. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. That guy Einstein. <laughs> he's pretty smart. I think he's pretty smart. He, you know, we used to have this expression when I was studying uh, accounting in college, and we used to say, "That Mister So and So, he knows something." But Einstein, you know, um, uh, you know, it's. Um, and he also said, "Imagination is the only thing. Imagination is more powerful than knowledge." You know, and and so if we can imagine a world that is love, then, then that's how we create. We create, that imagination is our divinity. That's the Jesus in us, right? Yeah. Jesus did say, you know, you, you can do the things I can do and more when you connect to that. Mm-hmm. So I, I, 
That Einstein, that's perfect. <laughs> now you're making me share another quote because it, I've shared this a couple times before, but it's relevant to what you just said. Okay. Let the villages of the future live in our imagination so that we might one day come to live in them. Oh, yeah. both of those are perfect. Yeah. So, I love that one. Yeah. And if you can, yeah. that one is so powerful because right now, people, um, you know, you, you ask people to dream and they don't know how to dream when they were kids, you know, who are you to think you deserve that? You know, what do you think money? Right. So we haven't, <laughs> we haven't encouraged dreaming. And so when you mm -hmm. tell them, imagine in the future that your black neighbor is going to be just as cool and just as great as you imagine your white neighbor is going to be just as happy and joyous and fun as you, you know, people, it's hard for us to imagine. And so really encouraging that imagination, um, encourage, that, you know, like John Lennon, imagine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I think, you know, when you brought up, I remember my mother, don't, don't be a pipe dreamer. You know, <laughs> don't dream. No, <laughs> you know, get off, you know, don't be on cloud nine. We're, 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 we were conditioned not to dream, yeah. not to imagine. Imagine yeah. when, when you connect with that imagination, which is that divinity inside that really, that is, that is our power. We are creators. And so if we can stick to our image and imagine it, we can create it. And I, I just think we don't believe we can create it. We believe that it's on the outside of us, but it's not, it's on the inside. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, there's another great quote here. Abram up here with all the good quotes today. Like, I mean, you, I had them all on deck. You keep, you, I wasn't even gonna show more than one, but you like, you just keep segueing it like you know what I'm gonna share. That's perfect. <laughs> And, and this is the thing, one of the things that I always talk about it, and I love your title, Tom, because um, I always talk about the power of one. People think, what can I do? And it's just like, well, you think about Gandhi, for God's sakes, he was one person, you know, and he right. started this huge movement, you know, and you think about Rosa Parks, this one person, you know, mm -hmm. think about Martin Luther King, one person, you know, mm -hmm. think about the janitor in your school. You know, for me, the janitor in school, he made all of us happy. He knew the nuns were horrible. And so he would come by and he could tell which ones of us had gotten it, you know, before. And so he would come by and he would try to make us happy. You know, the sixth grade teacher came by and basically made you feel OK. Who's it? You know, so we all get to be that one person. And by believing that somehow I can make a teeny difference. That's going to make your life better. That's going to make my life better. Like you said, Tom, when you bring that joy to somebody, it makes you happier. You know, when you bring that freedom, then when you bring that respect, you know, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, go ahead, man. I mean, uh, All good, man. Um, like sometimes bringing that joy is done by being an example of the opposite of what a person believes. Like, so just as an example, yeah, um, there's this this mindset that I see in this country of scarcity, that there's this this pervasive idea that there's not enough resources. And so therefore, we have to compete for resources. And that, like, if I had to pick one ideology that has led to the despair that we feel in this country today, that would probably be the one is this sure. idea of scarcity. Mm -hmm. And it's like in my experience, it's simply not true. And this is something that was pointed out to me when I was living on Hawaii for many, many years. You know, the Hawaiian culture isn't a culture of scarcity. They're a culture of abundance. There's enough of everything yes. as long as we live in harmony and we work as a community. Yes. You know, we don't we don't live in a scarce in the world of scarcity. Scarcity is a man-made phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a human, it's your it's a, it's using your human imagination the wrong way. It's just like the ego. It's the it's the space of it's an illusion. Just like the ego, it's a, it's a false yeah. concept. It's one of the we have a one we have some people viewing on Facebook. I was just gonna bring in one comment uh, from India. Jerlyn, she said, "Love begets love, and love is the ultimate remedy." Uh, I love that. it. Perfect. And love is love that. just produces yeah. love and more love. You know, you can't you yeah. get. Love is love is love, right? I mean, you can't even, even saying the word makes you happy. <laughs> you know what? One day.